welcome, welcome for everyone who's watching. Welcome to the Fashion Business and Career Show. I am your host, Tarina Nicole, owner of the Fashion Design Center of South Jersey and designer of Gypsy Leather Goods, a luxe line of leather accessories made from recycled skins. Today, we have a very special guest. We have Cueco Biriaco. He's the founder and designer of Chocolate Clothes. Cueco, we were just discussing, he is from Ghana, but he grew up in Nigeria and obtained a bachelor's degree in archaeology and information studies at the University of Ghana. Upon graduating, he set up a marketing company and evolved into a movie script writer and then into a clothing designer upon encountering business tycoon Philip Ayesu. Kweku launched Chocolate Clothes in 2013 as a women's line, but it quickly grew into a men's wear collection worn by American Black celebrities such as T.I., Steve Harvey, Boris Kojo, Cardi B, and African royalty alike. Recently, a new women's collection was announced on his IG and Facebook page, so that's exciting. Chocolate Clothes, yeah! <laughs> Chocolate clothes represents the Afrocentric man and woman, and it resonates with the cravings of his dark target demographic. The line has been featured in Vogue, Forbes, CNN, just to name a few major media outlets. He's community minded, and his short term goal is building a factory big enough not only to handle the production of his brand and sub brands, but also other fashion designers seeking to mass produce. And his long-term goal is to own the biggest African lifestyle brand in the world. Welcome, Kweku. It's such a pleasure to finally have you on the show. How are you? Doing well, doing well. And it's a pleasure to be on your platform. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I just want to get started in the beginning because your entry into the fashion world was not traditional. Like me, I went to FIT in New York City. I got a degree in fashion design, and you went everywhere else but. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm so curious about your start. How did you? So I, I, you know, reading your bio, understanding that it was an encounter with Mr. Philip Aesu that yeah. encouraged you to go into the fashion industry. But how so? Okay, so, you know, so his encounter, you know, so it wasn't that direct in terms of getting me into the fashion world. Okay. But what his encounter did for me was it opened me up into um, the marketing communication space, gave me an entry point into um, understanding just generally what life was all about. Mm -hmm. And, um, and his story is what his company, yeah, 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 what his company did was um, we served as a liaison between a lot of big brands out there, um, different hotel brands here, different banks around here, um, a, a liaison between them and then, the, and then the markets. So what we used to come up with were ideas on selling these brands uh, was promotional, you know, how can we promote these brands, et cetera. You know? um, I worked on beer brands, worked on pharmaceutical brands, so many different, you know, brands. And what that did for me, to, totally a marketing company, but what that did for me was to give me, for, for being a science student, so remember that I read science, I'm a science student. Right. Right. And so my thinking was in a science, was pretty much I was thinking like a science student. But then what that did for me was to open me up into other fields and other sectors, such as entertainment, um, communication, um, lifestyle, you know, et cetera. So um, it, was such, it was such a humbling time for me because I had so much to learn. I always knew growing up that I was going to end up in a lifestyle and, and, and entertainment phase. I started sketching when I was very young. Um, for the longest time, I wanted to be an actor. Um, wanted that's to be. That's where the movie script writing comes in. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so I guess it was really um, there was a lot for me to learn, and you know, coming from where I came from, and the, typically the family I also came from, which is a very intellectual family. 
Mm. Um, you know, everybody read science. My parents are professors. Wow. Um, you know, my oh, brothers oh, went to Harvard, you know. Yo, like it was <laughs> a whole lot of science, a whole lot of structured stuff, mm. you know. So just being, being or having the opportunity to be different, being having the opportunity to really have a look, a good look at, you know, how diverse um, this sector was and, you know, the best way I could actually leverage on this new opportunity was Through literally fashion. everything. Yeah. But yeah, how so, did you actually, because I mean, I really dug deeply into your brand and it's just, your brand is just the type of brand that everybody wants to be a part of, you know? You look at your videos and it's like, I want to be that girl. I want to have on that outfit. I want to be on that boat right now. <laughs> you know? You oh! Know? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Very no, I mean, inspirational. And so yeah. and you wonder, I mean, your, your image is very clear. It's a very classic polished uh sophisticated look and so it makes me wonder how did you learn design i mean because it's one thing to be able to sketch it's one thing to be a stylish person it's another thing to be a businessman but you know now tailoring and making clothing is a science within itself you know so how did you learn that so you know, I mean, I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna start by where you ended, which is you you hitting the nail the the topic right on the head. Um, fashion is a science. Mm -hmm. Fashion is a science, and you know, coming from a science the science background, uh, I quickly noticed this. I quickly learned that you know what to be good at the job, to be the best at the job, to be the most skilled at this sector, you need to understand that it's both. Um, it is fashion is both the arts and the science. Yes. And absolutely. so, yeah. And so, you know, um, I think, you know, let's go back to being kids. Um, my mom, my mom lived in Canada for a long time. And when she moved back down to Ghana, she bought all the kids, uh, sewing, sewing kits, sewing machines. Wow. And, um, you know, we all went through at some level, different skill set training, um, um, I learned how to cook and clean when I was about six, seven. Um, I learned how to drive unofficially when I was six, unofficially. Wow. <laughs> when, I, when I was six. <laughs> I learned how to do so many things. Um, onion, wash, sew, stitch, mm -hmm. all of that before I was 10. Wow. And so um, just growing up, we were just, we, we were, we, we had a lot of skill training. You were very uh, we went through that. I learned how to play chess when I was seven, six, seven years. You know, I was beating up old folks when I was like 10 or 12. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so we just had a lot of, we had wonderful parents who actually walked us through different skill sets. Um, so a couple of years after, um, when I was working in the advertising space, what it taught me was the opportunity to think outside the box. Mm. And I've always known I'm a different chap, you know, like different stuff. I like, I like just doing different. I'm just being different, you know? Yeah. And when I worked, when I worked and having the opportunity to think outside the box and being celebrated for it, it kept on edging me to do more. Mm. And, uh, the sister I follow who is also very, very, you know, probably even more creative than I am. Uh, was always coming to me when she was going to see her seamstress. Hey, 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 KB, I'm going for this event. Can I get an outfit? Design something for me. So that's literally how it started. And, you know, um, eventually, you know, she comes up with a dress and it's not as spiffy as I had designed it to be. So then I was like, you know what? I might as well just do this myself. Wow. So, you know, so I went back to the drawing board um, trying to understand uh, how fashion had evolved, um, and then you know started going around uh, my the you know the area in which I used to work. There's a little town in Accra called Asylum Down. Um, so I started going pretty much then all the you know neighboring towns to meet up different tailors, different seamstresses, just trying to understand what they were doing, the technical know-how. You know, how can I add this to that? You know, how can I be sure that this is not possible? This is wow. possible, etc. 
So you didn't get education, but you you created your own education. Totally, totally. You know, I I, I, I understood that to to get to the top, first of all, you require both the arts and the and the science. Right. And you know, what that was how I was going to blend both. You know, by trying to understand what was happening on the ground, trying to understand what's informally happening, and then read around, figure things out in terms of sketching. I'm always driven. I'm always, I don't have no in my dictionary. Once I think about something, it has to be done. You know, I thought about doing this hairstyle and now I'm doing it. And I everybody goes it. like, yo, what's, ha what's happening here? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> so, yeah, so I guess, you know, that was my first encounter really with um, uh, uh, fashion. And, um, you know, I started making women's stuff initially, um, I, you know, making different wet dresses, gowns. Uh, for some of my friends, girlfriends, you know, my female friends, my dead girlfriend, my, uh, you know, so many different, different people. And, you know, it got to a point, I noticed that the market was really saturated with different women uh, fashion designers. Mm -hmm. And we're doing a great, great, great job with it, at it. And you're still doing an amazing job. I mean, Ghana, West Africa, the whole Africa is a hub when it comes to uh, designing. And, and, um, you know, getting into that space, I had to be smart about it. I had to understand that, you know what, you do great, but, you know, you need to look out for the loopholes, which at that time was men's stuff. Um, I never really liked majority of the stuff our parents got us growing up. You know, they make you wear an African shirt and you almost look like um, the guy who is going to, sorry, let me get a good example. The, the guy who's going to top palm wine <laughs> from the next palm tree <laughs> when you're actually supposed to be at a party, you know? <laughs> no, that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> so I guess, you know, I, great. I was taxed with, okay, hey, how can you make this contemporary? How can you make, how can you build... Make it more modern and more sophisticated. Make it more, thank you, more modern, more sophisticated. How can you redefine, uh, you know, what sort of narrative that a lot of these um, African-inspired writers are writing about? You know, and so, you know, um, we wanted to, to have a perfect blend of that as well. Uh, so what I did was pick the culture, pick what is happening now, blend it, or pick what is happening now, look at how the culture could influence that bit. And, you know, we started initially with making shoes for men and women. Shoes. And then you, yes, yeah, shoes. Wow. Look, at, I can't show this leg. <laughs> <laughs> Loafers, slippers, um, wet shoes. That I just did of you. It's the post of, it's a video you made a little while ago, but I just reposted it because I love it because it's, it's primarily you. And I think right. the, um, the caption says success is a lifestyle or something of that. Yeah. You have on this amazing cape and your shoes. I noticed because the, um, the cameraman is behind you. And so the bottom of your shoes match the cape that you're wearing. And I'm like, damn, like people are stylish from head to toe. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying. You know, we're pushing, we push it, we push in the status quo. You know, we we are making sure that, you know, that sort of narrative which was said about us, you know, was said about um, the Afrocentric lifestyle was all not entirely true. Right. You know, there are certain aspects of, you know, the reality on the ground, which in actual fact, you know, the more you travel, the more you notice that there's a similar thing we go through, a similar life which is being said here is everywhere. It's in the States. I've been in different parts of the States that are way ghetto than parts of Ghana, right. uh, you know, uh, right. parts in Asia, parts in Europe. And, you know, you don't get, you don't get this out there on the international media. And so, you know, that's fine. You know, that's, that, that's some, um, you know, that's information out there, but there are certain aspects of Africa that has to be highlighted. You know, you made mention of the boats and other, you know, other props that we were using in this new collection, which is amazing. I can't wait. This is the first time I feel so alive. I feel, I feel like when I started chocolate, you know, so, you know, we wanted, to, you know, we wanted to highlight certain areas, you know, I mean, the year of return did highlight majority of the new Africa. But what we are doing is to highlight every single 
aspirational aspects of Africa and, and, and why there's a need for us to find our roots and to own us, you know, own our roots, own who we are. Own and we just story. come home and come home, mm. you know, come home. You know, we've got boats out here. We've got islands out here. You know, we've got, we've got, we've got look, mansions out here. It looks luxurious. And I, you know, it's funny because a good number of, matter of fact, my best friend is moving to Ghana. My best friend. Yo, you, listen, you better join her. Oh, I, I'm coming. Listen, yeah. I'm not letting her get yeah. too far without me coming and, and spending some time. Trust. But you yeah, know, you better. Oh, absolutely. But just having a conversation with my friends that visit Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, Ghana Morocco, Kenya, also, Zambia, Zimbabwe, South Africa, yeah. and they Senegal. All love Ghana. They all love Ghana. So I, I believe yeah. it. I believe it's beautiful. The food. Listen, the food is something else. I mean, when you go around West Africa, our food is just impeccable. Like, mm. you go to Senegal, it's a different conversation. You go to Liberia, it's a different convo. You go to Sierra Leone, yo, you go to Nigeria. And but when you come to Ghana, <laughs> it's something else. Ghana it's totally right. like the pepper, the sauces, the spices. Mm. Listen, like, you know, people don't, like, people don't, you know, I was actually mocking my brother. So my big brother, my big brother is married to an American lady. Okay. And apparently what's, what got them, so she, she used to live in Ghana like 15 years ago. And when they met, what started the conversation when my brother introduced himself to her being Ghanaian was that, oh, I love Killer Willie. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I love, I love Killer Willie. And Killer Willie, Killer Willie is a traditional... Ghanaian meal, it's like a ripe plantain. I you know, a lot of people don't know what plantain is. Great. So this is this is this is um chopped, chopped, chopped. Sorry, fried, chopped, ripe plantain. Okay, Ooh, that's a lot of I, English. You know, I love plantains. My well, one of my other best friends, her boyfriend of ten years is from Nigeria, and so because of that, she yeah. learned how to cook plantains for him. And I love yeah. them. I love them. Listen, listen. And we have, you know, we spice it with so many different cloves. You know, mm. we spice it with peppers, all types of pepper. You know, is it, Ghana, we have a, like 10 different types of peppers. The green oh, ones, wow. the red ones, the blue ones. Listen, the, oh, yeah. The emerald <laughs> ones. Like, it is, like the black ones. Quite so we spice this whole know. thing and then we fry it. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's what inspiration from. I get it. I, I, I get pulled over. Yo, listen, what's your inspiration? The, the food. Food. The culture. <laughs> the people. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> the music. Everything. Yeah. Wow. So I'm curious to know oh, what man. let you, oh, though, man. into entrepreneurship. Because, I mean, you could have designed under another brand. What made you decide to start your own business? Like, do you, I know you had a marketing business to start with. Like, is entrepreneurship common in, in Ghana? Or did you come from a family of business owners? What made you decide to go out on your own? <laughs> Interesting. So there's no, nobody, there's nobody in my family I do recall that's a businessman okay. <laughs> or a businesswoman. I think, I think maybe, my da maybe my mom's grand uncle, who probably used to be, like, I think he was the first guy in his uh, hometown uh, where we were from, who, you know, who had about 50 different buses. Um, and started the whole transportation uh, business in oh, Amina. Cool. But um, I think, you know, it's just, with the, it's just with my mindset and the way I think. Mm. Um, I have very high standards. Um, I have a lot of expectations. Uh, and, you know, I'm always trying to raise my personal bar. Mm. And so when you have a lot of, when you have, when you're hungry and when you are, and you have, dreams and you dream and you're always dreaming big mm -hmm. it's very difficult to have that contained um um probably while i was working for, for someone else yeah. but i was still you know but i'll be quick to highlight that i it started with me working with people you know when i was in university when i was in second when, when i was in my junior high i started working with people when i was 13 okay. you know informally you know working with my folks uh, we used to grow corn, grow different staples at home. So I started farming when I was very early. Um, you know, later on, I started working with my uncles. We started like a quiz show. Um, it's a quiz show in Ghana that celebrates uh, math and science. I used wow. to keep the scores there. Um, later on, I started working with a cocoa company. 
And then when I was in university, I started working with um, different, different, you know, institutions. And then when I finished university, I worked for six years before eventually branching into uh, chocolate. So I guess, you know, it's just, it's just the right, just the right time and then the right structure to it. Um, you know, I believe that in, in life, there's a time to, there's a time to learn, a time to earn and a mm. time to teach. Yeah. And so, you know, and all these are, they're all these intersects, you know, at, 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 at the learning point, you start a chance to teach your neighbor at the earning point, you start a time, the chance to still learn stuff and the time and the chance to still teach. And at the teaching point, you get a chance to do any, you know, all the, uh, the, the above too. So I, th I feel like entrepreneurship definitely is leadership. Leadership is a huge word a lot of people don't understand. Um, but it, it takes, they think it means it takes, being a boss. Uh, no, not at all. Not at all. Um, I mean, what does what, define boss again? In Ghana, in Ghana, we have a nickname to everybody who, everybody, and we call anybody who, who is everybody boss. Boss. When, 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 when anybody's calling you boss, it's it means nothing <laughs> that is so essentially essentially it's not it doesn't just mean being a boss you know leadership is sacrifice leadership right. is making a difference leadership is is such so many different words underneath it's and it's taking your community along with you it's building people totally up. totally totally i mean i mean one key thing i've just been so excited about was uh last two years we started making and a couple of years before actually we started engaging the community in terms of um, um making our own fabrics mm. um that started off um we were not really interested in you know doing a little video putting it out there for people to know that we're making clothes and empowering the the youth or the you know our environment we were just very bent on making sure that we were making the relevant impacts mm. in our communities and you know it's such it's so exciting when you know i keep on meeting young folks young people out there who have so much ideas so many ideas and you don't necessarily even have to be in um in fashion you know i remember a couple of years ago a couple of years ago i met this guy i was buying no you know noodles noodles is gradually becoming one of the interesting uh, staples in in Africa. Really? And uh, yeah, 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 it's called well. So uh, uh, one one of the big brands is called Indomie. Okay. Which is I think in Nigerian, is Indian Nigerian or so. But you know, so it's giving a lot of people business, um, giving empowering a lot of uh, young women. You know, so at night, every probably every junction you get to, you see a lady or a group of people selling noodles, spice noodles, with, you know, whatever. And, you know, I went there one, one day, very late, and I met a guy who was barely 16 years. Clearly, this guy was a local gangster. You know, you could clearly see that, wow, like, you know, what's the future for this guy? You know, and, and bear in mind that uh, a local gangster in Africa doesn't mean a gangster in the U.S., Okay. So, so you know, pretty much there's no clear path. There's no clear understanding of you know how the future looks like for that kid. But mm. this guy saw me. He walked up to me. Um, I think it's a few days. Um, I had been interviewed on one of the TV shows, and you know, a lot of people had had the the brand, but they didn't know who was behind it at that time. Um, and you know, I'm sure they were thinking it was some old guy with some beard. <laughs> you know, base brands. Um, but, you know, you know, he, they were so shocked. There was, you know, a young person like, like them, maybe a much young, much older, but I definitely looked like someone who, were, who resonated with whoever they thought they were. And, you know, you can, you can clearly see how humbled he was and how, you know, how he wanted to be engaged, you know, how he, you know, he felt like, you know, there was, there was a space in, Whatever, whichever industry that he wanted to do or get into, you know. So I think for me, it, it goes back to the word sacrifice. But did you give him a job? So we spoke, we spoke a couple of times. Um, I found out that he was more interested in um, carpentry and masonry. Okay. So, you know, I introduced him to other, you know, some friends of mine who were also trying to redefine and uh, uh, rebuild that industry. And, you know, 
It's been a while since I spoke to him, though. Give him an opportunity. Where I'm sure so many people just and it's still happening. It's still happening. We have consistently a lot of people who you know are kids, um, not kids, 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 but you know high school kids. But yeah, younger people, university folks who probably in their vacation wants to come by the shop, come learn a thing or two, um, you know, pass by the, you know, our, our, our studios, you know, just to, you know, engage themselves in wherever we are going. Oh, that's amazing uh, that you welcome yeah. them. Though. Yeah. And, and for me, I think the bigger, the bigger agenda has always been not just with Ghana or Dome where I stay or Ibri where, you know, I spend most of my time or, um, um, Ghana, as a matter of fact, I think it goes beyond just Ghana. I mean, I've had opportunity to do a lot of uh, training sessions, workshops. Um, had I've had a lot of uh, talks with uh, students from you know Zimbabwe, Zambia, South Africa, um, Kenya, etc. And I think the number one, the number one um, notion or the number one narrative. Um, most of our problem starts as Africans is really appreciating who we are as Africans and not to buy, buy into, you know, um, that, that narrative of we being, we being inferior, et cetera. Cause it's a big, 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 big problem. You know, I've had numerous conversations and all these kids do not believe that they can do whatever they can do, whatever they dream or aspire to do. Because for me, I think that's the number one. For them. Otherwise. Sorry. White supremacy has told them otherwise. Well, it could be that and many other reasons. Sometimes it comes from us as a people. You know, it's sometimes we're always going about talking about white supremacy, but sometimes the problem is also with us. How are we also empowering ourselves? Mm -hmm. You know, how, how in terms of support, how much support are we getting as black owned businesses? from blacks, how are we, how are we getting, how is, um, how is, um, even names to start with, even yeah. names to start with. There's a narrative behind my name. I don't have any English or Westernized name. My name is Kweku Bidiaku Udro, you know, Kweku meaning a typical Wednesday born. Bidiaku, which literally means a warrior, you know, um, and Udro, which literally springs from a traditional sort of medicine. Right. And, you know, this carries a lot of meaning. And, you know, it's time that most um, Africans and, um, you know, start owning up to some of these narratives, you know, starting to really welcome their names and not hide them. Absolutely. You know, um, and this is where the problem starts from. You know, I think about if we are made not to if we are made to think that our language is not sexy. Right. Our names are not sexy. Our hair is sexy. <laughs> right. Our medicine is sexy. You know, it has a huge, huge, huge um, downturn on how we think. Right. You know, so how then everybody, yeah. And, you know, it doesn't make us appreciate the country we live in, the least opportunity we all want to live and go live in the West. You know, it carries a lot of, it carries a lot of weight. And the, 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 the earlier we really take a look at this as the bigger problem, you can train people in whatever skill. They will take that skill and still run away to the West. Wow. And then they leave a huge gap. Nobody wants to be here. But if we are, if we are all supposed to leave, who will come and develop wherever we are? Right. And I mean, you, guys, you have so much value. I mean, not just in um, people but in the actual natural resources of the land you know you have totally. the richest soil you know you have the gold mines you have, you're africa like you are the dream i think for african americans some mm -hmm. obviously are brainwashed and they they love their uh oppression here in america but i think most of us you know look to eventually come to Africa to retire or at the very least, you know, own property there and build relationships there. No, like, you know, you hit a nail right on the head. And this was my message um, during last year, December, when we had a whooping. Um, I met so many wonderful people who came from the diaspora, um, who came to Ghana, came to experience our culture. Listen, it was amazing. Wow. Two years ago, the initiative was launched last year 
was a year of return. Now we're in, you know, beyond a return. And I guess that's the, that's the message, you know. We, 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 we in Africa are opening our arms, opening, opening up to, to, to all Afrocentric-minded folks, our black brothers, our, you know, to, to come back and come and have a look at what is out here. Yes, we might not have a lot of structures around here, but who builds those structures? People. We, we can build them, exactly. And, you know, you said one thing. You talked about how, you know, yes, I didn't have any formal fashion education, but I build, I build my own definition of education. So we need to try and figure out how, whatever structures, how do we build necessaries by us, for us? Right. By and, us, I mean, for who us. says that the next great fashion university can't be in Ghana? <laughs> yeah, you know, there's so many things, there's so many things, Bob, you know, I'll probably just keep quiet about because it's in our pipeline. Mm. But, um, you know, definitely, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're hitting all the right spots. And, you know, you know, you made mention of the fact that, you know, we're putting up a factory. Definitely that should be, that should be done any, any, any time soon. Wow. You know, COVID, COVID did slow a lot of things down, but Absolutely. definitely looking forward to more prospects. Um, you know, we need to build more platforms that celebrate our culture. Um, you know, thankfully, you know, our music is making a lot of inroads in, in the, in the Western market. And, you know, and it's not even, the, it's not even about the commerce that is coming with this for me. It's about how the young boy who is in Lusaka, you know, the young boy who is in uh, Rumokuta in, uh, in, uh, in, in Port Harcourt, will now all of a sudden feel like, wow, right. but now I do not need to get accreditation by listening to some rap or some R&B to get verification. You know, I can have my own type of rap and, you know, and then build my own story towards the top with right. Afro beats, you know, with high life, yeah. you know, with, um, with all that. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's a move, it's happening, <laughs> it feels like a paradigm shift, it feels like a, a, new, a, new, a new Africa, it's a movement as you already said it. Yeah, yeah, no, when I look at your, your marketing, for lack of another term, you know, it feels like a movement, like for me, Africa has always been cool. Like I said, you know, that's how yeah. I grew up looking at Africa as the motherland, the, the, the goal. But looking at the way you portray your imagery, you've made Africa cool. You know what I mean? You've made it, yeah, it looks like, it looks like a be, it looks better than any rap video. When I look at- We need to coach video, you. I'm sorry? We need to, be, we, we need to steal this, this phrase you just said, this video, and then put it out there. <laughs> you know, the, Africa is the new cool. That's the new cool. Get with it. Absolutely. <laughs> so, I mean, besides, yeah. besides Africa itself and all the different countries in Africa, where else do you find inspiration? Because I love the cut of your clothing. It looks very, um, just because it's very slimming, it does, you know, make you think of a more Eurocentric cut. So I'm wondering, where do you find inspiration outside of the continent? No, everywhere. I mean, I travel a lot. Okay. I travel a lot. So, you know, for me, as I, kept, I, as I keep on saying, it's always finding a solid blend between your nature and nature. You know, it's always finding that, um, that, that line, drawing that line and finding a good safe spot, finding a good blend of nature and nature. I'm naturally African, but, you know, I'm always getting nurtured. You know, I'm constantly um, trying to, you know, um, figure out, you know, different cultures, experience different um, uh, way of life, um, seeing how we can have a solid blend and um, bring out the best of probably um, what anybody will, you know, will rock. I, I think the best compliments I think I've had has always been, um, oh, that's a, uh, no, nah, so they don't ask, they ask, what is this? <laughs> that's the question. <laughs> What what is this? That is the question that's because being it's asked. So unique. It is totally unique because then you can't you can't you can't you can't place your fingers in terms of what it is. And I think that is what culture is all about. Mm. You know, for you to for you to blend it. For what's the best smoothie you've had? 
the best smoothie is what was when you it, it, it's 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 kind of smoothie that tastes like different different with different different uh, fruits in there and you can't put but, your finger but you can put your fingers thing. yes yeah. you can put your finger that yo the pineapple seems to be a lot no right. you know it has passion fruit in it right. it has cashew it has in it mango in there you know? <laughs> it has some mangoes in there some purple you know some carambola <laughs> yes so yeah so I know so, that yeah, so, yeah. I don't want to take too much of your time. I just have like one more question. Because okay, sure. Let's go. I, I, you know, I spend a lot of time educating young people, particularly um, teenagers who are looking to come into the fashion industry, considering going to college for fashion design. And so I'm curious to know, because you have such an international brand, you know, you're not just famous in Africa, you're famous in the United States, you have an international uh, appeal. So are there any particular steps that a young designer can take to build relationships so that their brand or whatever they are trying to put out into the world gets an international audience like you have? Okay, so, and, and this is the youth across um, everywhere in the world or the youth in yes. the U.S.? anywhere in the world. If you are starting out, you're designing, you're in high school, or maybe you're at the university, and you don't want to be limited to just being a local designer, you want your brand to be known around the world, how do, how did you start building these international relationships so that you know they can follow in that footstep? I think the first thing we need to encourage is dreaming big. We need to dream big. I know we, we especially in Africa, we don't have a lot of uh, examples of individuals who have been able to excel uh, beyond setting borders. We need to, first of all, and, and this is a call for a lot of, um, to get a lot of support, a lot of, you know, you know people to patronize um, the kind of business that we do because, you know, it goes, it transcends beyond just, you know, enriching, let's say, founders or enriching brands or business pockets. It goes to have examples, examples that when a lot of young individuals or the youth look up to in the environment, they can act clearly see that, oh, it is possible. Right, right. You know, our dreams, the dreaming big that I'm talking about, they can dream as big as they want to because X, Y, Z has done it. He right. fired all the oars and he's still doing it. More examples, more examples. So definitely dreaming big. And Dreaming Big will go hand in hand with, uh, with um, a lot of support coming our way so that we can leave, you know, massive, massive shoes for, you know, younger individuals to fill up. Um, so Dreaming Big, starting small, starting small. I feel like, you know, starting small requires a lot of experience. It's literally, we talking about experience. Um, we need to be able to understand that it's a learning curve. Success is a journey, it's not a destination. Um, every day we are learning, every day we are, we, are, we are moving, we are moving to the next level, every day we want to grow. That is starting small. You can't just get up one day and then be wherever you want to get to. Right. Starting small also means that you do not ignore the little, the little, the little signs. There's a popular African proverb that says that if you, if you, if you are ever going to um, mix the words small and inefficiency, uh, try, try having, try being in a room with a mosquito alone. Oh, yes, I've heard that. Yo, you, 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 you <laughs> let now, now go call someone small. Right, right, <laughs> you know? right, right. And so, and so, let's take every single opportunity we have, whoever we meet, whoever we interact with, as we are learning the skill, as we are growing, as we're building experience. Whoever we meet, we need to be able to interact, learn something from that person, um, take that person serious, let the person see the value you have. And, you know, one day, one day, you know, I was, I was watching this fashion show on Netflix and um, we were talking about all you need is one yes. Mm, this is all true. you need is one yes. You will get so many no's yes. and people need to understand that it's part of the curve, it's part of the process. So singing no doesn't mean that, oh, that's it. That's my end. No. You need to keep on going. The dreaming big that you, that you dreamt starts with that small 
there's the small decisions that you take and you continuously work your way there. And as far as as far as dreaming big, starting small is, it's not it's not um, okay, it's not uh, complete till you move fast. You need to understand that business business and where we are now in this world involves a lot of smart, swift decisions. Mm. You know, um, last two years, you know, the government launched um, the year of return. And I, I, I keep going back to it because I feel like it's the most, it's, a, it's one of the most innovative ideas any government um, will ever take. And it's such um, a good inspiration and motivation for other governments and initiative for them to take on, you know, they launched it. And you can imagine a lot of folks were just thinking, hey, a lot of people were trying to bite other people's ideas, right. trying to bring people down to be the most noticeable when, you know, we had a lot of people coming to Ghana. But for us, that wasn't the focus. The focus was like, what was the dream? We want to build the biggest brand, lifestyle brand in the world. Period. From Africa, period. Yeah. So once the world is coming to us, we need to be able to leverage on that. And, you know, we took a smart decision. We were swift about it. We positioned our shop in the most luxurious place in Africa, in, you know, in Ghana, or anywhere in Africa, anybody will want to be at. Um, spoke a certain language, make, made sure that was a brand we wanted people to know existed and carry that narrative they wanted to be part of. And today we have a chocolate. Amazing. Amazing. So many things that you said were so key, particularly taking um, advantage of the opportunities that come your way. Because there's so often that even the smallest designers, they look at certain opportunities like they're too small for them. There's no opportunity that's too small, particularly when you're first getting started. You know, you need to take every opportunity because you never know totally. what's on the other side of that opportunity. Who totally. On the other side yeah. of that opportunity. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. once, you know, we need to also understand that, listen, there's no, um, your life is full of sales. There's, um, life is always about the pitch. Okay. And in a pitch, you always want to pitch very well so you don't lose. In other words, it's not every pitch that you want to win. You just want to make sure you don't lose. Mm. And so, you know, when an opportunity comes and you have the privilege of, of, of not losing, you should you always want to win to take a deal. And, you know, that's the sacrifice I'm talking about. Yes. I've had to sacrifice a whole bunch. A whole bunch. And we are still doing it. Yeah. We are still doing it. But... So it never stops, right. you know, but we should just know that it's all about not losing. Once we do not lose, we should be okay for a deal. Right, because you have so many opportunities as long as you're so just still in the game. Yeah, absolutely. So, many opportunities. so I, I'm so grateful for the insight. Where can, people, where can people follow you? Where can people learn more about the brand? I mean, hey, um, well, so we just about launching our website on the 1st of July. Nice. It's the first platform I'm going to say that I've never given a set day or time. Okay, it's okay. going to be 1st July. Um, www.chocolateclothesglobal.com And, you know, that's where we're going to carry a uh, majority of our new collection. Um, so I'd like to urge everybody um, on the launch date, keep the launch date intact. 1st July, we're going live. Uh, but Instagram, Instagram carries, and I'm so, so grateful for everybody who follows us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We um, have um, a large following. People absolutely totally. love your brand. Totally. And it's so exciting that, you know, and we like to definitely reassure them and all our followers that, you know, they've not seen, they've, not, they've just seen the tip of the iceberg. Okay. There's a whole lot coming. Let's, let's support each other, you know. Let's push, let's push this dream to become way bigger, not just for me and you, but for our kids. But for all of us, our grandkids, and leave those legacies. You know? Yes, yes. Um, I'm all about yeah. that. Yeah. Thanks. But Instagram, we are Chocolate Clothes G H. Yes. Twitter, we are Chocolate. Uh, Facebook, Chocolate by Quick Diaco. But essentially, when you Google Chocolate by Quick Diaco or Chocolate Clothes Ghana, it all comes up. Um, I'm sure, yeah. And, you know, we're cleaning things up, we're getting things right. So, 
hopefully I'm sure by the end of this month, uh, end of July, we should be reachable everywhere in the world. Amazing. Thank you for your Lovely. time. I deeply welcome, appreciate darling. you. And what Anytime. Looking awesome. forward to you to come to Ghana. Listen. Okay, let's host you. Let's Trust host me. you. I t- I and tell t Barnes, tell t Barnes, I did tell her that she's always welcome to Ghana. Yes, and yes. So y'all are invited. Everybody watching us, you're invited. Awesome. You know, let us know we when you're in town. I'm calling you to ask you for a tour. <laughs> Listen, pause by Kempinski. You know, come by Kempinski. You know, you know, try and then sign up with t Barnes's crew. Listen, oh, get a tour awesome. of Ghana. Listen, that's, that's a whole lot happening. absolutely peace thank you are you welcome darling all right ciao all right bye 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 bye